Good morning. Boy, what a great day to worship. I, I actually was sitting back farther with y'all instead of I'm usually up in the front. I was sitting back with y'all worshiping today. Man, it was so, it's so cool to worship together, isn't it? I want to give you another chance. It's so good to worship together, isn't it? All right, all right, all right, good. That's just making sure. Because I was having a good time. I figured you all too. Um, this Jesus that we're singing about, the light of the world, who makes the darkness tremble. I want to ask you a question today. Is this Jesus that you know that is walking with you, that you're walking with, is he making the kind of impact in your life and through your life that the world, the darkness is trembling because of your walk with Christ? What do you think? You're like, whoa, no, no, I'm not Jesus. I'm not supposed to make the darkness tremble. I, I get that, I get that. But it's Christ in us. God has left us on this earth, right? When we got saved, he could have just taken us to heaven, but he's left us on this earth to make an impact. And um, I just wonder what kind of impact we're making. And I wanna challenge you today as we're in the second sermon in our series called The Sacred Overlap, we're studying 1 Thessalonians. I wanna challenge you today about the kind of difference the gospel is making in your life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And uh, this letter that we're looking at that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, I, sometimes I think people think, you know, that, that word Thessalonians, it's in the Bible, that's like a religious word, you know, the Thessalonians. <laughs> well, it's, the Thessalonians is a group of people who live in the city of Thessalonica, and the letter 1 Thessalonians is the, to the church. So Thessalonica is not a religious city at all. It's not a religious group. It's a pagan city in the Roman Empire. And I've circled it here because these are all the pagan cities that Paul went to preaching the gospel. And it's a city where the vast majority of the people, just like today, are lost. It's one of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire at the time. Uh, scholars think there was like 200,000 people in that city. And of the 200,000 people living in the city of Thessalonica, what would you guess is how many people were followers of Jesus? Just shout out a number. Someone said zero. Well, there's more than, there's more than zero. <laughs> a handful, maybe 50 to the max, maybe 100. So 200,000 people, and there's one church, and again, we think maybe 50, maybe 75 people in that church. And they're to, they're made, they're to make an impact in that world. And see, this is the same situation we live in. We're, we're in Christ, we're Christians, We've been saved by Christ, but we still live in this world. And where these overlap, this is where Christianity is supposed to make a difference. This is the sacred overlap. God's called us to not live in the bubble of Christianity, but to make, to make our Christianity impact our world and to overlap into the world. But the world we live in, it's a mess. And in Illyria today, we were actually talking a couple minutes about the Uvalde uh, shooting this past week. I don't know if we talked about that in each one of our campuses or, or, or if you've thought much about this, but that's the world we live in. The Buffalo shooting. You know, these two big newsworthy things. But friends, that kind of thing is happening all the time. It may not be 21 people at once, but left and right, city after city, horrible things are being done to people. And we can get desensitized to the, the violence. We can get desensitized to one more shooting. We can get des desensitized to one more city. What is it, Uvalde? You know, well, yeah. And how do you even say that? And, and we forget the lives that have been forever wrecked by that. That's the world we live in. Sometimes I think people think, well, the Bible, you know, it's about and all these religious people. And it, Things weren't as bad as they were then. I mean, things weren't, aren't, aren't, aren't as bad then as they are now. Oh, it actually might have been worse. 
I don't know if you guys are students of Macedonian history, Greece, his, Greek history, but there's a famous massacre that was unbelievable that happened in the city of Thessalonica, the massacre of Thessalonica. And as these people are wrestling through the violence that was done in their city, they may not have the technology to hear about what is happening in Philippi or Rome, but in their own city, there's this kind of violence that just makes people wonder, what difference is the gospel making? Is, is the light of Christ shining in the world in a way that's making an impact? Because if it is, it's through you and, and me. It's, it's not God's just shining his light up in heaven somewhere. We're saved. We're in Christ. And we're supposed to make an impact in our world. But too many times, the Christians live separate from the world. We live in our own little bubble. Oh, I'm in Christ. I go to church. I celebrate you know, all the things that I'm in Christ. And we leave the world to itself, whether it's ancient Thessalonica or whether it's modern Illyria or Avon or North Ridgeville or Vermilion or Lorraine. Where is the impact of the church upon the world? I'm kind of amped up about this today because Sometimes I wonder, are we making a difference? And I, sometimes we think, you know, God, why aren't you doing something? God has left you and me to do something. We are the light of the world. We're supposed to be loving our community to Christ. One amen. <laughs> I, I, it, yes, God's doing it, but he's doing it through us. Hey, but if we're living our own little bubble lives, how are we gonna make an impact in the world? See, this is what was on Paul's mind as he's writing to church after church, to the people who are following Jesus, living in a broken, dark world. You, you think that your New Testament is you know, it's so ancient, it's so relevant, it's like, the, it's like today's news. It's extremely relevant. So when Paul writes to the church of the Thessalonians, it, this was written to them, but it's written for us. To them, for us. It's not written to us, but it's written for us. So as you're reading the Gospels, as you're reading the New Testament, don't think of just history, especially when you get to the, the letters of the New Testament. It's, it's, it's written to situations like we are in. But it's, we're not just this church in the pagan city of Thessalonica that he's writing to, and, and we're not just a church in the pagan city of Illyria North Ridgeville, Illyria, Amherst, Lorraine, Avon Lake, Vermilion. You know, that's true, but the deeper truth is that we are in God the Father. We're, we're in Christ. We're, we're saved. We are these Christians, again, but we live in this world, and we're to make this impact. So that, that, that raises the question, the sacred overlap that God's called us into, how are we supposed to live in this? How do I go about living my life? Well, the whole letter of what we call First Thessalonians is to answer that question. So as we walk through this letter, this book called First Thessalonians, over the next couple of weeks and months, I, just keep, I want to keep reminding you, this, this is like a letter to Illyria. This is like a letter to Northeast Ohio. This is, this is you know, like a letter to us. And it's actually, I said that Thessalonica was, was like 200,000 people. I did something this actually yesterday or early this morning, I got the census out, and if you add up, like if you were to create, I don't know how close you are, um, how familiar you are with, a, with our map, but if you take Vermilion on the west and draw a line uh, to Avon Lake to east, and then go down to about North Ridgeville, then back over uh, west to Illyria to South Amherst, and then draw a line back up to Vermilion, that's like a big rectangle. That's almost the same amount of people, it's about, it's a little over 200,000 that lived in the ancient Thessalonica. So the, the northern part of Lorraine County, we're about the same size as ancient Thessalonica. And so as we read this, this letter, yes, it's written to the Thessalonians, but I just want to keep thinking, keep reminding us, it's written to us. And it's written to us, the church. And so let me just pause here. And if you weren't here last week, remind you, who is the church? Because yeah. I think we think, what is the church? The church is a building. The church is an organization. The church is an institution. It's, you know, we don't think of the church as the way the New Testament did. So 
I, I did this last week and I want to do it again this week. I'm trying to transform your thinking of church. So whenever you see that word, you don't think building institution group, you think people. You think people who, and then I'm going to use the Greek word, the word church is the word ek, so it means out of, and the word klesia is from the Greek word kaleo, to called out. So the church is called out, people who are called out from others, but not just any people, it's a gathering of disciples. So the church is a gathering of disciples called out from the world for the purpose of loving the world into discipleship, of making disciples. That's, that's the definition I want you to be thinking about. In fact, I want you to get this in your brain so much, I'm going to ask you, ask you to say it all with me. In all of our campuses, even if you're sitting at home, I want you to say this out loud. You may be the only person in your room, but would you say this with me out loud? The church is what? A gathering of disciples called out from others for the purpose of making disciples. Every time you see the word church, I want you to think that's, that's what the church is. And so it's these people who live in the world but who are in Christ making this impact. How do we do that? So again, last week we talked about one answer to that question. Today I want to look at verses 4 through 10 and see in these verses, how does Paul answer that question? How do I live in this sacred overlap? How do I live as a Christ follower in the world? And I'm going to give you a head, heads up. If you've got your notes, you've already seen this. What we're going to, Paul's going to do is he's going to identify seven distinctives of true disciples, seven marks of a disciple. So a person who's in the church who's following Jesus, a person who's a, a, a committed Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, seven distinctives. And as we look at those seven marks of a disciple, that's the, that's the way we're supposed to live. And as we're going through this, I want you to ask a question all, all morning long, all day long. And this, this, this question is, do you, or ask yourself, am I displaying any or all of these marks of a disciple? Are these seven distinctives? Now, there's more than this. We're just looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Will you just ask that with me all, all morning long? Is this true of me? Now, it's not true of all of you because some of you aren't yet followers of Jesus, but that's okay. I'm so glad you're here. You're, you're watching, you're learning, you're discovering. But for those of you who are Christians, disciples, believers, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever the power of the Bible wants to describe you, are, your, are, are, are these marks consistent in your life? Okay, so here we go. Let's read it. First Thessalonians chapter one. If you stand with me, do this to honor God's word. And if you want to sneak ahead as we're reading this, just see if you can figure out what seven they are. Here we go. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God. Such a, it's not a throwaway phrase, such a great phrase. Loved by God. We know that he has chosen you as disciples, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as the church. We know he's chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators. Ooh, what a word. You became imitators of us and of the Lord for you welcomed the message of the gospel in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers. Think of this. You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. That's like the, the county of Lorraine County or the region. You became a model for all these people. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned from idols, and we have them still today, to serve the true and the living God and to wait for God's Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. 
wow, that's a lot there. Let's sit down and start working our way through it. Asking this question, do I see these, any of these marks or all seven of these marks in my own life? And notice how Paul starts off this, this section in verse 4. He's saying, I know that you guys are real disciples. I know that you're true believers, that you're real Christians because, that's the key word here, because, and then he's going to list all these things, you know, in these next couple of verses. I see these seven things happening in you. So the first thing that he sees is the fact that the gospel came to you, not simply with words. You, you didn't just hear sermons preached. You didn't just hear someone talking, but it came with power. What power? The Holy Spirit and the conviction. In other words, what Paul is saying is that your lives have been changed by the Holy Spirit. The power of God has impacted. So that's the first thing to write down as the first distinct, or the first mark of a disciple is that your life is being changed. Not just was changed when you became a Christian, but you're on this process of your life is being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what he says in verse four and five, at work in the gospel. And you say, well, how does that happen? How does the Holy Spirit go about changing us? Well, interestingly enough, in the very verses that follow, in verses four through five and six, we get kind of a, an outline of how the change happens. It starts with this idea of being loved by God. Remember I said that's not a throwaway phrase? So the first verse in our passage today, verse four, we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God. Let's pause right there. It, what's true is that God loves the whole world, but there's only a small group of people who realize that God loves them, who accept that love just for who we are, who bask in that love, who receive the love of God so much so that the love of God begins to change their life. God loves the world so much that he gave his only son. But only Christians, only believers are the ones who have grasped that, uh, res responded to that love, received that love, and allowed that love to work in their life and still to this day are reveling, I like that word, savoring, basking in the love of God. So here, here's how this happens. You respond to God's love. No one becomes a Christian because they have filled out, you know, this form or filled out a bunch of rules or followed a bunch of rules. Christianity is not some moralistic set of rules. Christianity is responding to God's love demonstrated on the cross. And we go, wow, how could God love me like that? Good question, because he's God. And it, it's impacted you. It's, it's begun to change you. And you live in the love of God. It's, it's something that is impacting your life. And you're reveling in that love. And that love is poured out in the preaching of the gospel, in the power of the Holy Spirit. The next phrase, he says, our gospel came to you. And when he, he says that, he's talking about the, pre the sermons that were being preached by Paul in the city of Thessalonica. When he first came into the city and started preaching about the love of God, the good news of Jesus Christ, he said, you guys welcomed this message. You welcomed the gospel message. When you heard it, you responded to it. So it's the next thing to write down is your life gets changed by you responding to the love of God poured out in Christ, you welcoming the good news, which, by the way, the good news starts with the bad news that you're a sinner. This is why most people don't welcome the good news. They don't want to hear about the gospel because they don't like being told they're a sinner. So they're like, before it even gets started, they're like, I'm out. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. Well, that's, that's the truth. <laughs> the truth about each one of us. I mean, we like to compare ourselves to that shooter in Uvalde. I would never do that. You probably wouldn't. But have you ever hated somebody in your heart? Jesus says, if you hate somebody, you're a murderer. Whoa, I didn't say that. Jesus did. See, we look at the actions. Jesus looks at the heart. And when Jesus looks at our heart, there is nobody whose heart, he says, oh, you're good. You don't need the gospel. No, nobody. Every single human being, when God looks at our heart, he goes, you're in trouble. There's sin there. There's darkness there. You're living for yourself. The bad news is, you're a sinner and you're lost and you can't do anything to save yourself. That's pretty bad. 
And now you get to understand the good news, that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. You don't have to die for your sin. You don't have to pay the penalty that you deserve for the sin in your life and in your heart. That's why Jesus died on the cross for you. See, the the good news only makes sense when you begin to realize, wow, I'm a mess. As long as you think you're God's gift to humanity, as long as you think, I'm not as bad as she is, he is, then you'll never welcome the gospel. It'll never make an impact because you don't think you need salvation from Jesus Christ. See how how important this is when Paul says, you respond to the love of God, you revel in it, and you welcome that that, that gospel message. So when the the gospel was being preached, it wasn't simply with words, but also was was with power. Because, um, I mean, even right now when I'm preaching, I'm using words, and for some of you, it's impacting. You're like, wow, that's the gospel. That's true. I'm so glad you just died for me. Others of you, watch me. It's like this. It's just flying by your head. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? When is he going to be done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just words for you. And Paul says, for those of you who are true disciples, it wasn't simply words, but it was the power. So what happened there? When you heard the word preached, you submitted your life to the truth of the word of God. That's what it means to welcome the gospel. And that's why, as a Christian, I need to keep welcoming the gospel. As Christians, we don't just welcome the gospel once. We keep welcoming the preaching of the word. We keep welcoming the good news of Jesus Christ. We keep submitting our lives to the word of God and not just hearing words only, but with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's fascinating to me how I can preach a sermon that one person will say, oh my gosh, it felt like you were living with me all week long. I just, how did you know this about me? And I'm like, I didn't have no idea what, what your week's been like. That's the Holy Spirit. Or someone will say, that's exactly the thing I was wrestling with. And I'm like, yeah, it's not, not because I've been, you know, figuring out how to get into your mail. It's because the Holy Spirit applied that to your heart. It wasn't just words, but it was the power. And that's why, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people can hear a message and this many people go, yeah, whatever. And this many people go, I need to hear that. So that's my question with you today. Not just today, next week and the week after. Whenever you hear the word preached, what's your attitude? What's your response? Is it just simply words? Or have you opened your heart to the power of the Holy Spirit? Have you responded to the conviction? Paul says that when the word came, it came with power and the deep conviction, the the, the power of the Holy Spirit, because this is how the Holy Spirit works. When a person is preaching the word, not just telling stories, but when someone's preaching the word, the Holy Spirit's using that word to apply it to your life, and he's convicting you. That's how you became a Christian. That's how you grow as a Christian. Don't think for a minute that the conviction of the Holy Spirit is only for people who are lost, who don't know Jesus. No, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is that work of the Holy Spirit in everybody's heart, mine included. Whenever I hear something that challenges me, and the Holy Spirit goes, Jim, that's you. You struggle with that. Ooh, ouch. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What are you going to do with that? Shut it down? Walk away? Blame somebody else? Or are you going to own? Yep, that's me. I do that. I'm self-centered. I live for me. It's all about me. So that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And some of us are so good at turning that off, we can listen to a powerful sermon and go, whatever. <laughs> it's like, it's just words to me. So Paul is saying, you guys, you, you responded to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that's how life change has begun to happen. That's how it will continue to happen. Now we're about to get to the next level. We're, we're going fast from you're in the process of being changed to deep waters. I, should, I wish I wouldn't have said it like that. Because I don't want this to sound... Like this is um, 
special Christianity, or this is um, you know, only for an elite. This is for every Christian. It just, it, it bothers me that so many Christians are willing to settle for just getting a few things fixed in their life. Just settle for, well, now I know I'm going to heaven. They don't press into the next level of discipleship because that's where Paul goes next. Let's, let's see it. Verse six, you became imitators of us and the Lord. And this word bothers some of you. Let me, let, let's all just say it. I want, I, on the count of three, we're all gonna say the word imitators, right? One, two, three, imitators. You became imitators. I, I, I don't like this, and, and some of you are thinking, but this is people who are taking discipleship seriously. What do I mean? Well, we'll define this word imitator. Don't, don't think imitation vanilla or something that's fake. You know, do you, want, do you have a, a real leather Bible or imitation leather Bible? You know, do you have, you know, real chocolate chips in your chocolate chip cookies or chocolate flavored chips, imitation chocolate? So we don't like their imitation, but, but the word in the first century was used to describe following someone, that's what it means to imitate, following someone so closely that you become similar to them or like them. Now, Paul says you became imitators of us. And we're, and we're thinking to ourselves, ooh, they, they were imitators of Paul? That sounds like a cult, doesn't it? You can say yes, because it does. If you're just following a human and it's not also following the Lord, if it's just imitating a person or a group of people, that's cultic. That's a problem. That's dangerous. But that's not how the verse ends. You became imitators of us, period. No, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. But let's, let's take one thing at a time. It starts with you followed. You took discipleship seriously. You followed, imitated your leaders. This is what Paul is saying about the Thessalonians. This is true about every disciple. Because disciples are people who follow. Now, we say you follow Jesus to learn from Jesus, to become like Jesus. But the way discipleship works is just like parenting. That is, that God has given us parents, physical parents and spiritual parents, and the way that a child, the way an infant learns to obey God is they obey dad first and mom first. The way a child learns to trust God is they trust mom first, trust dad first. The way that a child learns to follow Jesus is by following mom and dad first. And we, this is the pattern, is that with baby Christians, young Christians need a role model. This is the way God's designed it. So as I follow my spiritual parent, I begin to realize, oh, I should be reading the Bible every day because that's what disciples do. I should be praying every day because that's what disciples do because that's what I see happening in the person who's discipling me. That's what I see happening in the person who's a role model for me, who I'm imitating. And if that person that you're imitating is a true follower of Jesus, they will lead you to not just be imitators of us, but also become imitators of Jesus. That means now following Jesus so closely that you become like Jesus. So the first step here in this imitation is following mom and dad, your spiritual mom and dad, your spiritual uncle, your, you know, the people that led you to Christ and are helping you take your first steps, but they should be pointing you to the Lord. Again, because if they're not, it, it's a cult. <laughs> it's stay away, you know. You know so Paul says, follow me, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. So important that we finish that verse. I had a person years ago in this church leave, angry, left the church because I preached a sermon a little bit like this where I was challenging that we need to have role models, that we need to have people to follow to show us how to follow Jesus. And he said, we should never follow a person. I said, right, period. We should never follow a person, period. But we should follow a person, comma, as they follow Jesus. He goes, I don't know. I said, read 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. He reads and he's like, well... Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow my example as I follow Christ. And I knew where he was coming from. He didn't want us to turn into a church that's following people. And I totally get that. But I said, 
the Bible has created, and God has created, and the Bible has displayed a pattern of young believers looking for a discipler, a spiritual father, a spiritual mother, mother, and modeling their life after them until they can get on their feet and they can follow Jesus on their own. And that's, that's, um, that's intimidating to some people, maybe you, because that puts pressure on you to follow Jesus in such a way that someone else could follow you. You track with me? I don't want you looking too close at my life because uh, I'm only following Jesus once a week. You know, I'm a pastor. I only work one day, one day a week, right? So don't follow me Monday through Saturday. No, no, I'm supposed to live my life Monday through Sunday. We're supposed to live our lives every hour of the day for Jesus. We don't have Christian moments and then secular moments. We don't have days where we follow Jesus or hours where we're Christian and then other times when we don't. No, we're all in as disciples of Jesus. We're following the way of Jesus as we are modeling and, and imitating our Lord Jesus Christ. So this, this way of Jesus is not something you do once in a while, one day a week. It's a life. It's a life. And the truth is, some of us don't like the pressure of somebody else watching us and then imitating us because we like living our Sunday Christianity and then Monday through Saturday, I live for myself. Am I stepping on some toes? I know I am. Whether, or maybe it's two days a week, or maybe it's parts of the day that you are all about Jesus. But then what about the rest? Could someone spend all day, every day with you and, this, and see any evidence that you are a sold-out disciple of Jesus Christ? Or would they say, you're a Sunday Christian? Or you're a sometimes Christian? And you're saying, preacher, man, you're just putting the, so all this weight on us. No, all I'm doing is opening the scripture and ex- helping us see, what does it mean to follow Jesus? It does not mean you come to church once in a while. It does not mean you give money to the church once in a while. It does not mean you have a Bible that looks nice on your shelf. It does not mean that you learn knowledge about the Bible, but you don't live it. That's not what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian is following Jesus, being a student of Jesus, his disciple, and becoming more and more like him, loving like Jesus, forgiving like Jesus, treating people like Jesus, living your life, spending your money, doing everything you do in a way that reflects Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to follow the way of Jesus. And so at Church of the Open Door, we've fo- followed the way of Jesus. We've watched the way Jesus described discipleship, and we've created this thing called a discipleship process. Some of you have seen this, so I'll just kind of review it pretty quickly. But I want to remind us, this is, we learned this process of discipleship from watching Jesus. And what we saw Jesus do was that as he's preaching to the masses, you can read about in the Gospels, as he's preaching to the masses, he calls people, follow me. He's telling stories. He's healing people. He's, people are hanging on every word. Wow, what an amazing speaker. But then he says, follow me. And some people go, I like to hear what Jesus says, but I don't want to follow him. And so of the thousands of people who heard Jesus preach, only a couple hundred, it seems, really discovered and responded to his invitation, follow me. He says one time to a crowd of people, whoever wants to be my disciple must take up the cross and follow me. And some people go, I'm out. Other people go, I'm in. And so to those people who said, Jesus, I want to follow you, he began to teach them. He began to teach them the word of God. Yes, he taught the masses, but he also taught his disciples. And he began to speak words to them that were full of life. In fact, we like to say that every word Jesus spoke was the word of God, because he is the word of God. So he taught his early followers to devote yourself to the word of God. And this wasn't just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just the gospels. In the book of Acts, now that the church has been born, the first time that the writer to the book of Acts describes the early church is Acts chapter two, verse 42. And he says, they devoted, there's our word, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That means that every time the apostles were teaching, the people were there. 
And that wasn't one on Sundays. Well, it was on Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays. Anyway, because it says they met daily in the temple courts. We're only asking you to come to church once a week. You know, these guys devoted themselves to the word of God. So every time it was being taught, they were there to hear it. And so here at Church Open Door, we invite you. We give you a thing called the daily devotions where every day you can spend some time reading the word of God, meditating on a verse from the Bible and just soaking that in. So you're devoting yourself to the word. And we say, do that every day. The devotions come out in, in emails, they come out on the app. But then in addition to doing that every day, maybe you can do that in five, 10, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, however long it takes you to soak in the word of God. Then we invite you every week, every week, not once a month, every week, meet together with the gathering of the disciples to sit under the teaching of the word of God. That's what happened in the early church. This is the pattern that Jesus set up. But it wasn't just being devoted to the word of God. Of all the people that would listen to him, and some said, I want to be his disciple, he grabbed 12 of them. You've heard this, the 12 disciples. And he put them in a life group. <laughs> he didn't call them a life group, but that's what it was, 12 followers of Jesus that he hung out with. And they did life together. So whether yours is a life group or a men's group or a women's group or a study group, some way that you're in a community, a small group of people following Jesus. That's how your roots get deepened. This is what Jesus did. Then he taught those 12 to do ministry. Not once in a while, but as a lifestyle. Our discipleship process comes right from the path of Jesus. He taught those 12 to do ministry as a lifestyle, serve people. And then, you, how many of you know this? Of all the many disciples he had, he took 12, put them in a group, and they chose three of those, Peter, James, anybody know, and John, Peter, James, and John. And that became his discipleship intensive group, D-I-G. Three people meeting with Jesus, that's four, and this is what Jesus did. He took Peter, James, and John by himself, and he gave them some intensive lessons. So we have discipleship intensive groups, digs, at this church. You can go onto our website, and you can find all this information about what a dig is. We invite you into this because this is intensive discipleship. And then we, as we follow Jesus through the Gospels, we see that not only did he preach to the masses, he also would teach in the temple. Preach to the masses, teach in the temple, or teach here or there. So they're like little classes. So we have these same kind of thing, an open door. This is our model we see just from Jesus. And I'm, I'm inviting you to take discipleship seriously as we imitate the life of Jesus, the way of Jesus, that kind of imitation, that kind of following Jesus takes you deeper into what discipleship is all about. And that's what Jesus calls us into. But, but, Every disciple of Jesus, those who follow close, those who are taking it seriously, and those who are watching from a distance, every disciple of Jesus will go through some kind of suffering. Paul says about these guys, you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering. But it didn't derail you. You did that with the joy given by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's always working. Next thing to write down is that when suffering came, in your life, it didn't derail you. The reason why I say it like that is because one of the sad things that I see as a pastor, I see this over and over again, I just, it bums me out, is people are all excited about following Jesus. I'm all excited about loving Jesus. Oh man, the worship services at Open Door are amazing. The preaching, the teaching, the people, it's just all, and then suffering happens. It happens to all of us. Something goes wrong. Something hurts. It could be severe suffering or it could be minor suffering. But suffering happens and people go, I'm out. I'm leaving. Because I don't want to follow a king, Jesus. I want to follow a genie, Jesus. Who's there in my little, what would Aladdin call that thing? Lamp. My, he's, in, he's there in my little lamp, and I can rub the lamp and say magic words. He comes out and does miracles for me. That's the kind of Jesus I want. He's not a genie. He's a king. And so he, he runs the world, and he, he runs your life. And when suffering comes, do you welcome it with the joy given by the Holy Spirit, or do you go, I hate you, God. Why did you do this to me? Give him the finger. Yeah. Curse God. How come you're not taking care of me? What kind of God are you? Wait, wait, wait. Time out. Wait. You're not God, he is. 
How dare you talk to God like that? But that's the way we talk to God because we want a God who's a genie. We want a God who will do for us. We, we live in a, a self-centered world, and in a self-centered world, God is just out there to meet my needs. That's not the God of the Bible. God is God. He's king. He's Lord. And you surrender your life to him. And when suffering happens, we go, okay, God, what's happening? We don't say, why is it happening? We say, what are you doing? Because the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Suffering happens to all of us. But God can use suffering in our life to, to, to shape us, to teach us to trust him more. God can use difficulties in our life to make us more like Christ if we will live surrendered to him. And if we will allow the Holy Spirit to change our life, point one, if we will take discipleship seriously, point two, and when suffering comes, if it doesn't derail us, then we will become, number four, a group of people who become a model. This is so intimidating. A model to other people. So write down number four. You've become a model of trusting God. You're a model of, to all the people of your faith in God, your trust, trusting God in difficulties, trusting God in the good and the bad. You're a model of that. That's what point number four is. And that being a model is back to the same idea of of imitation. People are looking at me as a role model. Remember Charles Barkley saying, I'm not a role model. Yeah, you are, Charles. Then People are paying you a lot of money to play basketball and they're looking or watching you. You're a role model. Friends, you're a role model, whether you like it or not. Somebody, and probably be for many of you, a lot of people are watching you, people in your family, people in your neighborhood, and they're asking, so you're a Christian? Is that what it looks like? And you can all day long say, well, I'm not really a strong Christian or I'm just a young Christian, but people are watching you and they're trying to figure out what does it mean to be a Christian by watching you? Are you a model of trusting God or are you a model of trusting in yourself. As you go through the steps, the distinctives, the marks of being a disciple, the idea is that you become a model for other people to go, oh, now I can see what that looks like. In order for that to happen, just like with the Thessalonians, you're going to have to turn from the idols of your life to God. So number five, you've turned from idolatry. I know, I know when I say that, People are like, you know, Jim, nobody worships stones and rocks and carved out wood idols today. Well, there probably are some in some, you know, faraway tribe. So we don't have idolatry today, right? Oh, you, you, you know we do. Our idols, I brought one. It's, a, it's an apple idol. You know it's an idol because watch people. They're, they're constantly on their phone. It's their whole attention. It's their life. And if you lose, I'm going to throw my apple. Don't freak out. You lose your iPhone, it's okay. It's got a nice case. You you freak out. That's my life. You know what? That's your idol. John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol factory, meaning we we can make idols out of just about anything. We make our kids into idols. We make our spouses and idols. We worship our spouse. We worship our kids. We worship our money. We worship our job. We, we turn anything into an idol. You got to turn from those idols, turn from a false God to serving the real, true, living God. That's how you became a Christian. That's how you live as a Christian. I told the first crowd that I'm surprised. I've been a Christian a long time. I'm surprised at how many idols God has pointed out in my life as, um, as I've grown up, grown up with him. You'd think I'd get to a point where he's, got them all, he's gotten rid of them all. Finally, Jim, we've gotten all the idols in your life. You know, I'm a pastor for crying out loud. You'd think he would have gotten rid of all the idols, but I'll be talking to God one day and he'll, be, he'll point out to me, Jim, you've turned that into an idol. What? Yep, you got an idol. What are you gonna do with it? Well, I'm gonna... Turn it over to God. I'm not, gonna turn, I'm not gonna worship that false God. I'm not gonna bow down to that thing. I'm gonna serve the living God. That's the next word I want you to put down is that real disciples serve God by serving people. I, this, is, this is the distinctives that Paul keeps listing for us. I know, you're looking through these going, man, that, this, is, this is intimidating. All these marks, I, I don't mean for it to be intimidating. And Paul didn't mean for it to be intimidating. 
He's just saying, how do you live in this sacred overlap? How do you live in this world where you're a Christian, but this world is dark? You live as a disciple. You sell out to Jesus Christ. What are, the, what are the marks? What are the distinctives of somebody who's living all in for God? This is the seven that we've got. So we're at six. We've got one more. Last verse, verse 10. It says, not only are you serving the living true God, but you are waiting for his son from heaven. Now, I, so the last one is that you're living in anticipation of Jesus coming. And I got to tell you, well, somebody left their iPhone here. I got to tell you, um, the Holy Spirit has convicted me personally. I'm, I'm your pastor. And he's convicted me of my lack of living in anticipation of the coming of Jesus. Oh, I know he's coming. I can talk to you about it. But the truth is, he's pointed out to me, I have not been living in in the eager anticipation of the coming of Jesus. And by the way, if that's true of you, your life is different. You spend your money differently. You live your life differently. You invest differently, you know, invest in people differently when you are living in the anticipation of Jesus coming again. I'm not saying you don't invest money. I'm not saying you don't uh, do things that are for the future. I'm just saying you live differently. And this is one of the things that he's pointed out to me is, Jim, you, you've not been living anticipating, but that's what a true disciple is. So I, your pastor, have had to confess, Lord, relight in me a fire for the anticipation of the coming of Jesus. Light in me a, 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 an eagerness for Jesus to come. And since I believe he's coming, that means there's, there's an urgency in my preaching. There's an urgency in my relating. There's an urgency in the fact that Christ is coming again. Are you ready? Or are you ready? He's coming. It, it's not a fairy tale. It's not it might happen one of these days. No, he's coming. So if all these seven marks, these seven distinctives of a disciple, it might just be that this seventh one, is the one that most of us struggle with the most. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not you. You tell me, as you compare your life to these seven marks, which ones, you say, yeah, that's true for me, that's true for me, that's true for me. Which ones are you go, well, that's not me. I, whew, I gotta work on that. That's, that's your homework. Gives you something to, to, to do. But here it is for me, number seven. So um, this is why I'm preaching from First Thessalonians because some time ago, God began to point into my life, Jim, Where's your urgency about living for the coming of Christ? And that's why I'm preaching 1 Thessalonians, because that's what it's all about. Jesus is coming. This is where you say amen. Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. Are you ready? Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, 20, that what did he say? 720, uh, just lost the verse in my mind. 721, as many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, I, I did this for you. I did that for you. But Jesus said, I never knew you. you. You weren't my disciple. You went to church. You did churchy things, but we didn't have a personal relationship. You weren't waiting for me. I just want to close this service by asking you the simple question, are you ready for the return of Jesus, knowing that he said that some will say in that day, what do you mean I'm not a disciple? What do you mean I'm not a follower? What do you, what do you mean I'm not in? This is what Jesus says. Are you ready? And I mean that for, in, for two groups. For some of you here today, you're not Christians. You're not following Jesus. You've never given your life to Christ. Today's a great day to do that. Stop living for yourself. And say, I want to I want to live for Jesus. I'm gonna surrender my life to Jesus Christ. You could do that right now. And then there's the second group, and those of you, those of you who are Christians, but you're not really living as a disciple of Jesus. You're just playing the church game, you're just playing the Christian game. I want to invite you, go all in. <laughs> Sell out to Jesus. Start living for his. His coming again. Start, start living a serious life of discipleship. And just over the next couple of days, compare yourself to this list. How do you do? Let the Holy Spirit point out to you any areas in your life that you're really not living as a disciple of Jesus. And to that end, to that end, let me just pray for you right now. Lord Jesus, you're, you're so good at this. 
point out in our lives where this seven marks, these seven distinctives don't line up with us. And you're not a condemning God, you're a convicting God. So you don't come to condemn us. You come to convict us of our sin, to convict us of our neglect, to convict us of our self-centeredness. Again, not to trash us, but to help us. So Holy Spirit, just as we've talked about you today, convict us, measure us, and then fill us, Holy Spirit, with a desire to follow you more closely. Call us into discipleship. Stir in us this anticipation of Jesus coming again. Open our eyes and our hearts to this message in the New Testament where everybody who was a follower of Jesus lived in anticipation. He's coming again. Are you ready? He's coming again. Even so, come, Lord. Some of the last words in the Bible. Come, Lord. So I close this sermon inviting you to work in our hearts. And we say, Lord, this world is dark. It's broken. It needs the light of the gospel. So shine in us and through us. May we live in the readiness and the anticipation of your coming again. For we pray this in your holy name. Amen.